biggest quality that we can cultivate in this time is adaptability. And then I remembered that that's what Darwin thought too. <laughs> so I think if we can all be adaptable to our circumstances, we can find a great deal of new and fresh pleasure that we have not experienced before. Um, so I'm, without really any further ado, I'm going to welcome Monroe and all of you. And thank you for being here. And Monroe, thank you for coming. And it's all yours. Rachel, you can take me away. Thank you, Barbara. Ooh, this is exciting. <laughs> um, yeah, so just asking everybody to bear with us as we work the kinks out this first time around. I look forward to adding some things in as we go, maybe some music, um, certainly joys and sorrows. Um, I'm getting some uh, uh, tips from other congregations about how to integrate these in, um, in streaming services. So yeah, so it's only gonna get better as time passes. So, and I do look forward to when we can meet again in person. Um, that's gonna be totally awesome. So, and I think we'll appreciate that more than ever when it happens. So, our opening words today come to us from the Chinook people. It's a blessing. We call upon the earth, our planet home, with its beautiful depths and soaring heights, its vitality and abundance of life. And together we ask that it teach us and show us the way. We call upon the mountains, the Cascades and the Olympics, the high green valleys and meadows filled with wildflowers, the snows that never melt, the summits of intense silence, and we ask that they teach us and show us the way. We call upon the waters that rim the earth, horizon to horizon, that flow in our rivers and streams, that fall upon our gardens and fields, and we ask that they teach us and show us the way. We call upon the land which grows our food, the nurturing soil, the fertile fields, the abundant gardens and orchards, and we ask that they teach us and show us the way. We call upon the forests, the great trees reaching strongly to the sky, with earth in their roots and the heavens in their branches, the fir and the pine and the cedar, and we ask them to teach us and show us the way. We call upon the creatures of the fields and forests and the seas, our brothers and sisters, the wolves and deer, the eagle and dove, the great whales and the dolphin, the beautiful orca and salmon who share our Northwest home, and we ask them to teach us and show us the way. We call upon those who have lived on this earth, our ancestors and our friends, who dreamed the best for future generations and upon whose lives our lives are built. And with thanksgiving, we call upon them to teach us and show us the way. And lastly, we call upon that which we hold most sacred, the presence and power of the great spirit of love and truth, which flows throughout all the universe to be with us, to teach us and show us the way. May it be so. And so I invite you now to take that chalice or that candle you have at home and uh, get your lighting device out. And uh, together, let's read the words from our chalice, knowing that we will hear each other's voices across the time and space, and uh, light them. 
We light our flame and chalice to illuminate the world. The world we seek in the search for truth. truth may we be just. May we be just in the search for justice. May we be. Somehow I am I muted? Okay. There we go. So I invite you now into a time of meditation and reflection. And uh, wherever you are in your home, to just settle in and relax. Close your eyes, get comfortable. Take a few deep breaths. <sighs> Relax into the stillness and the silence. And into that stillness and that silence, I offer you these words from Lynn Unger, Unitarian Universalist, Universalist minister and poet. It's titled Pandemic. What if you thought of it as the Jews consider the Sabbath, the most sacred of times, cease from travel? Cease from buying and selling. Give up, just for now, on trying to make the world different than it is. Sing, pray, touch only those to whom you commit your life. Center down. And when your body has become still, Reach out with your heart. Know that we are connected in ways that are terrifying and beautiful. <clears throat> you could hardly deny it now. Know that our lives are in one another's hands. Surely that has become clear. Do not reach out your hand. Reach out your heart. Reach out your words. Reach out all the tendrils of compassion that move invisibly where we cannot touch. Promise this world your love, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, so long as we all shall live.
some of you will recognize the blatant ripoff of the title of my little talk today. Love in the Time of Cholera by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. His novel spans more than 50 years, and like all good love stories, true love prevails in the end after overcoming many obstacles. Whether or not love prevails in our currently unfolding story remains to be seen. We might ask, what is love? Our old friends, the ancient Greeks, understood several different kinds of love, marked by varying degrees of affection and connection. There is romantic love between partners. There is the love we feel for our friends, the love we feel for our family. And all of these have their time and place, and they exist simultaneously together in varying degrees. <clears throat> and then there is agape, an altruistic, selfless, unconditional love sometimes called spiritual or religious love. This is the ideal of love, one that is free from desires and expectations and loves regardless of the flaws and shortcomings of others. And it's what the Buddhists describe as metta or universal loving kindness. Our faith calls us to love in this way and how are we to love in the time of Corona? There are many obstacles in the way right now, personal, political, physical. The virus has forced us into our homes. We are physically, sometimes emotionally isolated. And when we do go out, we may or must distance ourselves from other people. Our economy may be deeply damaged. Many jobs have been lost. Our politics has weakened the social fabric and what little social safety net we have. Many people do not have the resources to meet the crisis and do not know where to turn. And all of us fear what the future might bring. It has been a sudden and stunning reversal of fortune. And we, we have been humbled. How are we to love? Wendell Berry offers us this insight in his essay collection, Standing by Words. He asks, what can turn us back into the sphere of our being, the great dance that joins us to our home, to each other and to other creatures, to the dead and unborn. I think it is love. I am aware how baldly and embarrassingly that word now lies on the page, for we have learned at once to overuse it abuse it and hold it in suspicion. But I do not mean any kind of abstract love, adolescent, romantic, or religious, which is probably a contradiction in terms, but particular love for particular things, places, creatures, and people A love requiring stands and acts, showing its successes and failures in practical or tangible effects. And it implies a responsibility just as particular, not grim or merely dutiful, but rising out of generosity. 
I think that this sort of love defines the effective range of human intelligence, the range within its works that can be dependably beneficent. Only the action that is moved by love for the good at hand has the hope of being responsible and generous. Desire for the future produces words that cannot be stood by, but love makes language exact because one loathes only what one knows." End quote. And I think this is one of the most beautiful phrases I've encountered in a while. Love makes language exact because one loves only what one knows. And so in some very real sense, as our world contracts, our love is given the opportunity to expand as we come to know our immediate surroundings in a more intimate way. We most deeply love that which is at hand, which we can know with our sight and our hearing and our touch and our feeling. And that is the same as that which is at hand to other hands and other eyes and other ears and others feeling. Because it's all the same, you know. The mother in Tehran coughing up a lung who loves her kids and is loved by them is exactly the same as the mom in New York coughing up a lung who loves her kids and is loved by them. I don't, we don't always think of it that way. There are people who don't even think a mom in Albuquerque is the same as a mom in New York, much less a mom in Tehran. But they are the same, exactly the same. It's how Gandhi defined religion he said, I call him, them, religious who understands the suffering of others. And I might add, who understands the suffering of others, not as some abstraction, but through their own suffering. Who understand it through their own particular grief and loss, their own hunger their own fears, their own pain, and know that they are the same. Who feel those things because they love particular things, their particular life, their particular family, their particular friends, the particular landscape they inhabit, their particular community. And so here in the time of Corona, in this time of isolation, we've been given a rare opportunity, an opportunity to deepen into our particular grief and our particular loves, and for that deepening to move us into action. Action for the good at hand, for the good that is right in front of us, action that is responsible and generous, as Wendell Berry imagined, might arise from that love, that particular love. We're called to humbly reweave the fabric of love, of affection and connection that binds us one to each other starting with that which is right in front of us, with those around us. With creative deeds, with kind words, with generosity of spirit, this is the difficult task that lies before us. We rebuild the world not from the top down or the ground up, but from the heart outward. 
as the ripples of our loving actions spread to the farthest reaches of our knowing and beyond. So let me close this short homily with these words from Wendell Berry. <clears throat> I stand for what I stand on, he says. The local landscape, the local community, human, animal, and vegetable alike. I see that the life of this place is always emerging beyond expectation, or prediction or typicality, that it is unique, given to the world minute by minute, only once and never to be repeated. And this is when I see that this life is a miracle, absolutely worth having, absolutely worth saving. We are alive within mystery by miracle. We are alive within mystery by miracle. And if we take nothing else with us from this time, let us take that one thought. Let it motivate us and motivate our love. Thank you. Barb, over to you. Monroe, thank you so much for that beautiful homily. It was so perfect. And um, the poem that you read in the beginning <laughs> was also perfect. I read it a couple weeks ago when all of this started and um, was struck by how much profound how much more profoundly it resonated with, I'm sure, all of us. So thank you for, for all of that. I loved it. You are all um, most welcome. Pardon me? I said you are all most welcome. <laughs> almost or all most? <laughs> all. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> all right, so now is the time for the sharing of the... Um, the sharing of responsibility. And I don't happen to have a basket with me and it wouldn't do me much good if I did. So I'm just gonna talk to you about um, what I would normally talk about. Um, that is, if you have a pledge, you can mail it to Betty at her house or at UCOT at the PO box, um, which I have forgotten at the moment, but you can always get that from, from Betty. And um, also you can donate on our website if you want to. I just don't think I would do that though because uh, there's just a lot of hacking going on these days. I think it would be better not to donate through the website. Um, and then also I wanna, if you haven't already heard, and I, sh I think most of you probably did get my letter, um, that the board decided to have a fundraiser um, where we would use 5,000 of those precious reserves. We're always talking about what are we going to do with those. Uh, we decided what we need to do is just the right now need for people who are going to be going hungry. And um, so we're asking everybody to donate as much money as they possibly can so that we can match funds up to $5,000. And um, feel free to give any amount and we'll give it in the name, the common wealth name of the Unitarian Congregation as that beacon in the Taos community that we really have wanted to be all along. And maybe this will help. It feels like a drop in the ocean right now, but I think it's, it's quite significant um, if we can raise $10,000 and give it toward the two causes of helping immigrant families and also mostly um, hunger, because there is going to be a lot of, lot of hunger in this community, and we want to do what we can. So please plan to donate to that cause, um, maybe with your government stimulus check. Uh, I know that I'm going to give half of mine. I can't afford to give the whole thing, but I'm going to give half because I want to feel a little bit of the pain that everybody else is going to be going through. 
Um, so you just give whatever you feel comfortable giving. Yeah, I think it's now more than ever more important that we begin to, I don't know about anybody else, but I am so lucky and so blessed. And really that was more a matter of luck than anything else. And uh, yeah, to be able to give back out to those less fortunate than we are, which has always been the call for religious people to do, to heal the world and make it a better place. So in closing, I would like to share with you another poem. <laughs> I know all our poetry addicts are getting a big hit this morning. Um, it's from Laura Kelly Fanucci. And uh, I just ran across it this morning in my Facebook feed. And it goes like this. When this is over, may we never again take for granted a handshake with a stranger. Full shelves at the store, conversations with neighbors, a crowded theater, Friday night out, the taste of communion, a routine checkup, the school rush each morning, coffee with a friend, the stadium roaring, each deep breath, a boring Tuesday, life itself. When this ends, may we find that we have become more like the people we wanted to be, were called to be, and hope to be, and may we stay that way better for each other because of the worst. And so, I invite you to extinguish your chalice or your candle now as we read these words together. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again, virtually or in person. And so I invite everybody now to virtually hold hands with the person next to you in the Zoom feed. And uh, let's say the words of our benediction together. May love and skill guide our hands. May love and courage fill our hearts. May love and wisdom light our minds. May love flow through us and walk among us as we live our lives and work to rebuild our world into a better place where we are the people that we wanted to be. May it be so. Amen, amin, shalom, and blessed be. Assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum, aho. And uh, we'll see you again soon, I hope.